good evening everyone thank you for coming uh thank you for everyone thank you everyone for turning up on time and earlier than we expected i don't think uh, we had planned for that uh, i'm pratik wagre uh, with the internet freedom foundation uh, and i'm probably going to be the first of many people to uh, you know today i'm going to thank you for coming on a weekday evening taking time away from your uh, busy schedule right to join us on a thursday to celebrate you know, the the landmark nine judge bench which affirmed the right to privacy uh, as a fundamental right Uh, for indians now i also have the unenviable task of teeing us up before we get to the important conversations that you're all clearly here for not to listen to me right but let's start with some some time travel right uh, so, so 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 bear with me a bit right uh, if you want to close your eyes do that uh, let's go back to uh, you know 24th august 2017 and time travel is possible right we reached the moon yesterday uh, so all we have to do now is just figure out how to go faster than Two nine nine seven nine two four five eight meters per second, right? Which is the speed of light for those of you who who didn't go through IIT preparation, right? Uh, but but nerdy, inaccurate engineering non-humor aside, uh, let's go back to that date. Channel whatever optimism we had at that time, right? How many of us thought that it would take more than five years uh, or nearly six to have a data protection law, right? Now, if you want to say I, you can say I. If you want to think quietly, yes. uh that's fine as well right uh, but if you did 5 years ago uh, or 6 years ago think that then i'd say you're very cynical uh, or you're just cheating right now with the benefit of hindsight right uh, but let's let's do another thing right how many of us thought 6 years on we wouldn't have a privacy law in the spirit of the judgment but well, if you did you were right right uh, now at at this time some of us may feel there's a sense of despair right but I, you know i i want to take this opportunity uh, all of you have turned up here right to urge us uh, i think i've been censored well played mike okay uh, right so uh, you know urge us to keep on fighting uh, at iff we certainly will but we look to all of you you know our community uh, for energy and in turn we hope to uh, you know send some energy back you know back your way right uh, and days like this are a reminder for us that perseverance pays off right so essentially what i'm saying is to sustain the right we have to sustain the fight right uh, now uh, won't take too much more time let's just go into it so privacy as we all know you know supremely important right uh, also supremely nuanced <laughs> see what i did there with the supreme uh, right but in the years that we've been doing this event we've looked at how it's we looked at it from very different perspectives right how it interacts with gender and sexu- sexuality how it interacts with criminal justice uh with surveillance and pegasus uh you know access to information uh, and and things like that right now as the judgment uh, contends privacy is dignity it autonomy uh it liberty right and if you take uh julie cohen's lens of information capitalism then you can also argue that in today's world privacy is about power right uh so it's about so if i were to take examples from you know from from the real world right it's uh, or from uh, from our everyday lives uh, it's about the dignity of not having to upload a selfie as attendance right or wear a gps tracking app uh, it's about the autonomy of uh, you know to to not have your photograph taken uh, if you're going to someone's make believe elysium to deliver a package right just because they use a certain app uh, it's about having the liberty of going to an airport and say hey this is my face it's not a boarding card right uh, and it's about the power not to be coerced to linking your voter id with an aadhar card right uh, now for those of us here uh, i assume we are here because of a sense of duty towards not just defending and protecting the right to privacy but also also advancing it right i, I think i can make that assumption on all your behalf uh, so it's important for us to continue uh sort of engaging with it and how it impacts you know different up, uh, aspects of our life uh, ex- ex- as well right so so in addition to i guess re energizing and sustaining our fight uh, we also have to explore how it uh, how it plays out with uh, with contemporary developments and and historic historical reality right which is why today uh with with you know we're looking at it from uh, the perspective of artificial intelligence uh, digital public infrastructure Uh, and cast right and how that interacts with with privacy and uh, and digital rights right now to do that we've got uh, we've got two what we are calling duologues uh, and a panel uh, right so first up we have a duologue which is uh, let's just say a relatively freewheeling 
uh, conversation right on uh, the non artificial consequences of uh, of ai right and for this i have the pleasure of introducing our first set of speakers for the evening uh, who will keep us riveted for the next 30 to 40 minutes right uh, no pressure uh, <laughs> so so first we have uh, dr shivangi narayan uh, researcher with the algorithmic governance and cultures of policing project uh, and and samad bansal uh, an independent journalist writer and coder good evening everyone i'm very glad to be here i've been a, a donor to the internet freedom foundation for many years now and they i'm just acknowledging how iff means a lot for me they also helped me with the legal case for some of my reporting so i'm very indebted to the foundation and so it's such a pleasure to be here as part of an iff event i am feeling very good how are you shivangi i'm scared <laughs> as anybody who has a, who has trouble talking to a lot of people at once does but i think the more we speak about ai i'll feel better so <laughs> so uh, yeah i mean if he can talk yeah. yeah so when i accepted the invite for this panel because i'm a journalist i thought i have to interview shivangi so i said yes <laughs> and then later it turned out uh, we both have to talk yeah. so because we have 30 minutes what i will uh, just to set context about our backgrounds i am a journalist and i have studied math and computer science so what and shivangi uh, has background in anthropology and she's done more ground work in terms of systems and she'll talk about it so the way we will have this discussion is that i will do more macro discussion on where uh, you know where the world of ai is going and what are the big themes right now and shivangi will go more micro i think that way there can be multiple perspectives the thing is that i am very hesitant to make any certain statements about ai it, it's just very hard so i'm putting it right away so that i don't have to keep adding that caveat again but just just so everyone knows okay so let's start shivangi what is ai for you wow uh, so uh, the title says the non artificial consequences of ai and i think i'll quote great kate crawford and then say that ai is not artificial and it's not intelligent and uh, there's a certain hype about it right now and a lot of things that we call ai um, is just like a lot of data being crunched and sometimes it's a lot of politics and a lot of media that is uh, being given a name uh, of artificial intelligence just to kind of throw accountability to a certain technology that the public has no idea about probably the people using have no idea about but it's just like oh it's ai so it might be good you know so i think it's it's a lot of things and uh, a lot of researchers would not be able to pinpoint to what ai is actually but in current context in the way machine learning and uh, ai tools are being used i would say it's just that uh, it's political and it's social and it's technological so it's a lot of things mixed together so from a from a technical point of view you know there's a joke in the computer science community that uh, ai is anything that a computer can't do right now okay so for example back in the day in the like before 2000s you can say chess a computer can't play chess so we built systems that could play chess and in the 90s if you followed gary kasparov was defeated by a computer program and said that's ai today you will not call that ai because you know it's just a game so what is intelligent there or you can also call ai is the science of making machines smart so that's the perspective we take but then it goes into all sorts of complicated questions about what is intelligence so you know questions around you know it's cognitive it's philosophical all of that so shivangi and i were talking that why are we having this conversation right now like what is at stake so the, the difficult thing to talk about ai in public today is that we don't understand like you know are we all on the same page about what we are talking and do we understand the technology itself so i'll take a you know moment like just a few for 5 minutes to set the context about today's discussion that what are the stakes so stay with me so again in a at a first of all how many here use chat gpt at least on a weekly basis yeah. okay so i like what 70% of the audience no, okay no, so see this chat gpt thing that came to our life say a year ago the underlying techno like let's say technology which is the gpt has been around for a while it's just that chat gpt made it as accessible to all of us and then we are thinking about our jobs and so you know it the stakes became higher but i know like friends who have been into this world they have been telling things that are happening now since like 4 years and i was like you are just hyping things things won't happen and then 
I was like, this year, I was like, whoa, this is this something real is happening. So the big picture distinction is, earlier, a lot of AI was rules-based. There were certain rules that you can define, like chess, that we know that there's a way to win a game of chess. These are rules and these are heuristics. If you can teach a computer certain, like, these are the rules and you have to win the game, it will figure something out. What is happening today is different. It's not anymore about rules and heuristics. You kind of tell a computer, this is what I want to do, and the computer just figures it out. Like, I, I'll do my job. And it has, you know, a lot of great things, but also a lot of problematic things, which we'll talk about. But this is what is at stake, that we are getting into a very different world where machines are actually becoming autonomous. And the second thing is, the pace at which AI is improving is very fast. And in my regular conversations, this is the point I try to drive home, that in, like, a journalist I really like, he gave this analogy, think about it as the coronavirus time. You know, you know the exponential curve that today there are like 10 cases and suddenly you have 1,000 cases. AI is improving at that pace. So... Uh, I wouldn't say improving, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we'll talk. So just like in terms <laughs> of, for me, improvement is like what, if there are certain tasks, can AI achieve it? So like, I don't know if people who have used chat GPT 3, 3.5 and 4, Oh my God, like the improvement in terms of Again, things that I get it to do. What? Again, yeah. improvement. Okay, so this is interesting. <laughs> Please talk about what do you mean by improvement? Let's, let's talk about it. See, the point is that if you look at artificial intelligence from a certain viewpoint, which uh, a lot of researchers in my area would call the God's eye view. So then, you know, the, you have no vantage point and you can just say that, oh, it's improving because, you know, probably it's not harming you. And probably you are not, your vantage point is so normalized in that entire society that it doesn't even feel different. But, uh, so let's say I study AI in policing. I study, you know, predictive policing and I study facial recognition. And when you say facial recognition is improving, who is it improving for, right? So we need to, we need to be looking at improvements in what context. Can you talk so more you, about that? Like I can, so, so, uh, so in the West, facial recognition would be all about accuracy, you know, because there is a certain uh, race uh, difference there and, you know, uh, and there has been so much research about how black faces were not recognized or were recognized wrongly and then white faces were recognized correctly, fine. You come to India, the context is completely different because of course, we have ethnic differences and uh, there is a lot of difference in faces, but we don't have those stark racial demarcations. So then how does facial recognition work in India? In India, residential spaces as a proxy for a lot of social markers, caste, class, so many, you know, you live in horse caste, posh, you live in Northeast Delhi, not posh. Facial recognition will work very, very differently for people in horse caste versus people in Northeast Delhi when it comes to the institution of the police. So when the police works, uses the CCTV camera to identify people accurately in Hoskas, it is helping the people of Hoskas because the Hoskas people are posh and important and you know, worthy of being protected by the police. You come to Northeast Delhi, they're assumed as criminals already. Or, you know, you work with the system where which, which tells you on your face that you're a criminal, even if you've done anything or not. You know, you see Patal Lok, there's this amazing series, right? Yeah, yeah. With, in, the, in the beginning, it says, uh, the main character, Hathi Ram, I think, he, he tells his uh, associate, he says that, you know, people uh, uh, in Northeast Delhi are policed so that people in Noida, Vasant Vihar, Hoskas can live peacefully. So it's the control kind of policing. So when they identify people accurately in Northeast Delhi, what are they doing? They're criminalizing people without, uh, you know, without any reason. So I've done a lot of work in uh, the uh, use of facial recognition in Northeast Delhi riots investigation. And uh, people were accurately identified. And then what happened? You know, they were probably passing by. Okay, fine, the riots happening and you're passing by, but you're caught in a CCTV camera. And then you're accurately identified by the facial recognition algorithm. It's very improved. But then what happens is that person is nabbed and that person is arrested. And, and the only reason that the police gives them is that you, know, you were identified by a facial recognition algorithm. No reason, you know, I might be there walking by, I might be running away from the scene of the crime. I might be, you know, just, just going to hail a rickshaw to go to my, go meet my family. I might be self-protecting myself, you know. So, uh, and I could go on and on about how uh, there were CCTV cameras 
in Northeast Delhi investigations, which captured uh, majoritarian mobs, uh, killing people, attacking people, which magically vanished. And then only, and if the minorities were even self-defending themselves, those footage were used to accurately identify those people. And then uh, they were arrested and they've been in jail for like, I think three years now, um, without any trial and without any. So yeah, so, so if you talk about improvement, I think you should talk about which vantage point, where are we looking at? We're not looking at it from a God's eye perspective or a majoritarian perspective. Please understand that those improvements don't work for. Yeah, so just to push this a bit more. So there's the two strands here. One is strictly technical uh, application. Well, let's yeah. say I'm the engineer. Hmm. My job is that today I'm able to accurately identify say 90% hmm. of faces. And uh, we are just talking, let's say facial recognition right now. Hmm. And Tomorrow, if I build a system that's 100% accurate, let's say, yeah. so I will say I've done my job, hmm. okay? That hmm. So that's improvement. Yeah. So are you suggesting that, um, you, and you're talking more about the social context, socio-political yeah. context in which the technology exists. Exactly. So are you saying that this 90% uh, to 100% does not mean anything at all, uh, just to push for the criminal justice system? Is that the argument? Yeah, see, the point of the criminal justice system, and I think Nikita is here and she would have so much more to say about it, is, is not to find the criminal, right? So the criminal justice system was established, if you look at it historically, to find the deviant. And the deviant's definition keeps uh, changing every, in every society, in every century. And the deviant might not be the criminal, you know? He, he or she or they might just be doing things differently from the norm. And the moment you develop a system to find the deviant, and then you say, oh, I am going to build an accurate system to find the deviant. And then that deviant is just poor thing, you know, that person is just not living how the society is living. You know, maybe you're, you know, you're a homosexual or, you know, uh, you're, you're a Dalit or, you know, you're a, so anybody who is not the norm, who is not the normative Hindu upper caste family is now a deviant. So, so now you have accurately identified the deviant. What good have you done? I mean, you know, you are an engineer and you've obviously you have the best and you have developed a system that accurately identifies. But what are you identifying? And you know, have you really studied, uh, you know, what would be the consequences of identifying this deviant? You know, because that deviant is not really the deviant objectively speaking, right. you know, the technical language that you would speak. It's not an objective deviant at all. It's not a neutral definition of a deviant. And there are lives at stake, you know, there are, there are entire communities whose lives are at stake. But uh, engineers would behave as if they don't belong to a society. They don't come from the society. It's like the culture kind of, you know, works around them and they live in this technical, neutral, objective heaven. Uh, where nothing touches them from the society. Obviously, because most uh, engineers are upper caste men. Um, you go to Silicon Valley, they'll be, uh, again, upper caste men, Indians, and or white people. And uh, maybe I'm not saying that they are bad people. It's just that they have never seen the realities outside their own social kind of, uh, you know, sphere. So, so maybe I'll give them a benefit of doubt that they're not bad people, they're not evil people but they just don't know. And that is also a problem because, you know, if you, if you work in a kind of a bubble and say, this is the bubble and this is the world, that is also a problem. Yeah. Very interesting. So I, I again, zoom out a bit and yeah. I would like your Sorry. views yeah. on how it, like, again, these are some technical term terminologies that um, if you follow the Silicon Valley debate, you'll hear about them. So the two specific things that the way AI is being developed are quite talked about. One uh, is what we call like the emergent behavior of technology. The second is, you can call it the, like the alignment problem, which uh, Shivangi just touched upon. So I'll tell you the emergent behavior, which personally worries me a lot, is that you, as I was talking in the beginning, right, you design a system to do a certain thing. That, okay, uh, you're um, writing a certain algorithm to say, um, write an essay. That, that's, that's what you want to build the technology for. And you realize a month later that, oh, this same technology is now writing code, which will build AI systems on its own. So this is what we call emergent behaviors, where the system that you're building starts doing things that you did not ask it to do. So when you have such a setup, like, what do you even do? Like, how do you plan, if you're talking about risks, 
how do you plan for risks that you can't foresee? If you can't predict anything, then how do you even think about regulation? That what are the kind of things that will happen? So that is emergent behavior, very prominent topic being discussed. And the second is the alignment problem. The alignment problem is, again, a lot of the AI systems that are developed, the again, as a, at the risk of oversimplification, one of the core ideas is that, do you have a goal that you set for the system that, look, this is what you're supposed to do. This is our objective. So for example, in the in a facial recognition system, the objective could be just accurately identify faces. That could be the objective. But so many things are happening in this black box. Some input goes in, some output comes out. So within that black box, how do you ensure that at every step, the incentives of the system are aligned to meet the output? So that is the alignment problem. For more context, you can look at all around you, right? In your institutions, in the way we think about policy, uh, we talk about incentives a lot, that how do you make sure that incentives are always aligned? And it's such a hard problem. You know, like you in universities, you can have, uh, you know, like my, my pet peeve are GPAs and grades. You know what, like the objective should be that kids should study well and tests should measure it, but do grades really do that? So there's a incentive problem there. Similarly, we are thinking about incentive problems with AI systems, that's alignment, which is an interesting example there is with a uh, criminal justice system, which is that, uh, and just something for all of us to think about, can we predict crime is the question. Like, can you, like, how do you predict crime? The data that goes into the algorithm is about arrests, is about who gets convicted, but is so effectively what you're building is a system that can predict arrests not a system that can predict crime. And are these two the same things? Who gets arrested and who is committing a crime? So it's something to think about here, right? Like, uh, what is that? And we always have a proxy. We we'll never have, like when you're building models, mm. like what is something that we have the data that we can train something yeah. to achieve an objective? Which so what is, do you think? Yeah, uh, that, is, that is one of the things that uh, the, the way AI would be uh, advertise, let's say, would be like, oh, we can predict crime, you mm. know. Uh, I remember when Delhi police did its uh, uh, predictive policing thing in Hindustan Times, it was all about, you know, finding crime before it happens. Right. And then you, you're like, okay, fine, how does that happen? And then they will say, okay, fine. So we are looking at uh, the calls that are coming on the number 100 uh, call center. And then we are mapping that on a map. And then we are predicting where the next crime is going to happen. And we've chosen like four random crimes and this is what we're going to do. But when you look at, when you go deep and when you look at those dial 100 call center calls and who is calling and you know what, what are these call centers and what are these call takers believing, then you realize that the data that finally comes in is, is again, uh, again showing that, okay, certain parts of the city are more problematic they call more often. Crimes happen more in that part of the city. You know, people in these posh areas, they don't call, you know, they don't have the, they don't, so these call center people will be like, oh, these posh areas people, they don't have the time to call the police for small things. Yeah, because they have a direct hotline to the SP, right? But they don't have to, they, the, the only way somebody poor in this country, in this city can access the government is through the 100 number. I think in that way, it democratizes a lot of things. A 112 number that, okay, fine, at least you can call and that person will answer. Sometimes he will not even answer, but still, at least you can call. So obviously that person will call the police for so many instances. But the other person does not even need to. But in that sense, what is the data showing? At the end, the data shows that, oh, problematic part of the population. Let me increase policing here. Let me, you know, send more people uh, there and let me arrest those people. And then what, what they start doing is they start arresting people even before they have done anything. And I think Ghazala Jamil has done a lot of good work on this, that Northeast Delhi people will come to, let's say, CP to hang out. They're having fun. And the police will come to them and they'll say, oh, where, where do you stay? They'll look at those guys and they'll say, oh, where do you stay? And they'll say, okay, achha, I live in Silampur, get out. They will say, get out. So that is the perceptions that these data and, you know, the way. So we think technology is working objectively and, oh, fine, we're going to find the data and then we're going to predict the crime. But what happens is that before the data can even do its thing, you have certain perceptions that are made by the data. And it kind of solidifies certain existing assumptions. So, you know, it's not like the data is telling you anything new. 
it's all your assumptions being reified in that data. So if you already think that, oh, these girls from Northeast Delhi, you know, they just have a fight with their boyfriends, and then they call the police, and the police goes there, nothing happens. So your entire idea of sexual harassment for a girl in Northeast Delhi is completely different from, let's say, a woman in uh, any other posh areas. I don't know why horse cars keeps coming in my mind. <laughs> but, but yeah, let's say, you know, Green Park. So, so that is, you know, that is the entire problem that I had when I went to when I went to Delhi Police and I worked. I think my ethnography work was for two years, and for two years they would keep telling me that oh, these people are the problem. You know, you you should do an NRC. They will say oh, you should do an NRC. You know, so that you can find out all the immigrants in Delhi. They are the problem. So when you work with those assumptions, then those assumptions kind of come into your data. And then that data, then you will put that data and you will say, oh, I'm going to predict crime. How are you going to predict crime? Because crime anyway is not objective, right? Uh, today you think this is crime, tomorrow you think that is crime. You know, this keeps changing. Uh, mathematically, I mean, you would know, it, it's not uh, at, at entirely possible to find out crime objectively because every day the definition keeps changing. And then you will say, Acha, Today, sexual harassment is this. Tomorrow, sexual harassment is that. Oh, this is not. I mean, you should listen to the police officers. They'll say, oh, two people have to robbery. Hai. Three have to th theft. Hai. And I'm like, how do, you, how do you know that? Is there a standardized uh, definition? No, no, that's what we think. That's how the data is being generated. And then you say that you're going to predict crime accurately. Like, how are you going to do that? And then when you look at the way they're doing it, they don't have an address database of Delhi. They don't have that. Delhi is not a blank city at all. So they're like just mapping things, you know, manually on a computer. They're like, Achha, yahi hoga. I'm going to put that. How are you going to do that, right? First of all, your data is like whatever is coming to your mind. You're mapping whatever is coming to your mind. And then that entire package gets uh, advertised as, oh, we are predicting crime accurately. So, you know, what you probably assumed in the back of your head that, okay, fine, these areas are problematic. Now you have technical proof. Oh, these areas are problematic. So now, so those, then that has consequences, right? The, you know, no businessman will ever go to Northeast Delhi. Uh, oh, it's a problematic, it's a crime area, crime infested area. So we need to talk, when you talk about, okay, fine, we're making a model and what are the risks, talk to anthropologists, first of all. Second of all, just try to move out of your bubble of your know, you know, technology bubble and try to realize that fine, there are some things that the that maths cannot probably do, you know. Uh, you don't need big models to predict crime. Just have like just try to work with the communities, yeah. try to work with the people, and yeah. probably you won't have crime. So are you are you basically also suggesting, right, that if uh, the policeman can now say that I, I am not saying this person is a criminal. The algorithm yeah, is saying exactly, it. Exactly. So it's evading exactly. accountability. It's, a, it's an accountability issue because mm -hmm. now what happens in, you say, oh, how did you identify this person as a writer? They'll say, oh, it's a facial recognition okay. algorithm. I'm not going to do that. So it's an accountability problem in an institution which already lacked accountability to begin with. Yeah. Sorry, I'm hijacking with so the So now I, I'll do something that uh, as a journalist we do and some people don't like it, which is balancing. <laughs> so I'll give you the, like, I have a slightly less, uh, like, of course, like while understanding the problems with AI, I think a lot of discussion goes into this direction, but there's the other side, which just for context, I'll share. So one is that uh, personally, also because like I come from this community and I also do journalism, I think this narrative that uh, engineers just do not think about society issues. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 I, know. <laughs> See, I, know, I know, I know. I know a lot of engineers get, I am an engineer turned sociologist. Yeah. So I'm not against engineers, yeah, yeah. but uh, no, no, a lot of engineers don't care. No, no I, I know, yeah. I know. I, I totally, I totally sorry. understand that. And again, just so that this is not a defense of anything. Yeah, I'm just yeah, yeah. trying to say that based on interviews I've heard of people building this technology, let's say I didn't get this sense that they are completely ignorant. They think about it. Problem is that it's the perspective is really, you know, I think goes back to where we started. Hmm. That what are you optimizing for? Right? So as yeah. a, as a as an engineer, my job is to make the system amazing. Yeah. And it's just that uh, yeah, so I'm just saying that the perspectives are different. It's just that it's super simplified to say that they don't know anything. 
Okay. Okay, fine. They also do know something, but they are not bothered to know about the other thing. Sure, sure, yeah. Great, great. Just, okay, <laughs> second thing. Uh, uh, totally, I think this is, uh, and also like, uh, I, I'll never defend my community. I was just trying to put a point of view. Other thing is that, uh, uh, which of course, lead, like, so in terms of the reason, I think for me, why I'm also interested in AI is not just because of the problems. One of the things that for me is the most exciting is AI actually solved the protein folding problem. Okay, this is something to understand that uh, the argument that a lot of people building AI technologies, they will not talk about what Shivangi is saying. They will say, look, we are building systems. If we solve the problem of intelligence, we can talk about what intelligence is, but let's say we're able to do that, then great things will happen. We'll be able to solve cancer. We'll be able to find uh, you know, new, new drugs for disease. We will be able to find solutions for clean energy. The world will become better. So that is a lot, like if you, again, if you listen to interviews, that's a very driving motivation for a lot of uh, people building AI. But the thing is that once that underlying intelligence is built, it also leads to all sorts of problematic implications for society. So it's, you know, like most technologies, it's, a, it's like a dual thing that, and as a society, we have to grapple with that, what do we do about it? So yeah, uh, the, the only reason I mentioned this is to say that uh, there are actually genuine problems that AI is solving. But the question is, and Shivangi, you tell me what you think about it, is uh, for me, this comes down to, again, incentives. Let's say today, a lot of the AI systems and the great advances that are happening, uh, they are concentrated. You know, like the big news that comes, comes from OpenAI or Google or Meta or Microsoft, right? That's where all the action is happening. A lot of investment at this point seems to go into safety research, if you follow the debate. There are researchers studying safety. Will that continue to happen or not? Okay, will, you know, will there be a business model logic five years from now or not? Will we invest more in drug discovery or will we invest more in like a software that can write better email? Like, okay, an email software can save me five minutes, save me some embarrassment, but it's not like, you know, you know, it's not like life changing thing. So a lot of it is about like where as a society we invest I mean, our I'll efforts. I'll give you an example. The client, the earth is burning right now, right? But what are we doing about it? So in that way, a couple of people killed because of AI. Nobody cares, right? So, so if we can guess where it's going, I think it's going in a very bad direction. And I completely agree with you that AI can solve a lot of, you know, Problems that should be solved by engineering, should be solved by, you know, experimentation and science. Please stick to that, you know. Please don't come for emotion recognition and crime recognition and facial recognition and gait yes. recognition. Yeah. Don't do that. Because, so this engineer, they'll be like, oh, you don't know anything about models and you don't know about anything about AI. How are you talking about it? So I said, you don't yeah. know anything about gender or crime or, you know, caste or nothing. So don't work on those things. Yeah, but... but the problem is that the incentives lie yeah, here. Yeah. You know, big governments are ready. So I spoke to people who work on startups and facial recognition, and they say the big money is coming from governments who want to have facial recognition uh, as part of their, you know, security yeah. infrastructure. So if the money is coming from there, if the investment, if the hype, if everything is, if, you know, the glamour is there, they will obviously, you know, go there. So that is a problem that, fine, uh, there are a lot of good yeah. things that AI is doing, but here... This yeah. is where we should start. Which is why I think this, uh, and the discussion is important, right? That, uh, like, which, that, that, like, like, what are the non-artificial consequences? Like, what are the risks? And again, I keep, like, the pace at which I think the engineers are working, I don't see that the similar pace we are developing our understanding yeah, of not. the risks and what it can do to us. So, which is why this conversation is important. We're running out of time. I'll say one last point. Uh, which is about the question of accountability mm -hmm. and transparency. So again, in regular debate, a lot of calls for make the algorithms transparent. Okay, if we know what is happening, you know, then we can hold them accountable. But the thing is, again, if you look at from the computer science perspective on this, is that let's say I, uh, for sake of discussion, let's say um, uh, some person is wrongly convicted because of uh, a problematic algorithm for facial recognition. And this person goes to whoever company that did this, give, uh, show me the algorithm. Yeah. Okay, show, show how did you find it, okay. You know what you'll get in return? You'll get one million page of 
one billion arithmetic calculations. But that person doesn't need to go to the function. Wait, let me finish the argument. Point I'm trying to make is that we don't know how these systems work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even the people who are building this, as far as from what I've gathered so far, no one knows. It's a black box. The thing is that something goes in, something goes out. There's a whole neural network thing which you can study about, but there is no design here. It's just that get us something. So and the point isn't that scary. No, that's exactly isn't that that's scary. No, so that's the right? thing. The question of algorithmic uh, transparency in in this AI context, like I don't understand what to do about it. Like this accountability no, there, is very hard. There does not need to be algorithmic uh, uh, transparency. Like obviously, I don't know how to read that algorithm, yeah. but I should have harm redressal. I should have yes. a justice system that would listen to me. I should have a policing system that will not arrest me and keep me behind bars for two years without trial, yeah. and you know, uh, not give me sufficient reason for why I'm there. So those are the systems that are not in place. But you are racing against time to find out these algorithmic systems that are doing whatever you you don't even know. You de yourself said that the engineers also don't know. So if you don't know and you know in which society we are living in, in what kind of a world we are living in. So what, what I think we're running out of time. So yeah. what do you think is the based on your, you, you, so you have interviewed police officers, you have seen people who have been implicated by these technologies. Yeah. And uh, so like, how, like, given the, now th this is out of the box. So like, what do you see? How do you see things happening? Are there any things that we should be thinking oh, of as society? A very, I have a very dystopian uh, uh, approach or whatever. I, I don't see any hope if this continues. I, I, seriously, like I'm not going to raise anybody. Tell us your doomsday scenario. Uh, it's a it's a doomsday scenario, you know. Describe uh, it, no. Probably, you Let know, I'm in an intercast. I'm in an intercast marriage. Uh, I always keep thinking that one day they're going to identify me with all these algorithms that they are running. They come to they'll come to me and they'll say, oh no, your marriage is not valid. Uh, whatever, I don't care. And some Kafka dystopian syndrome is going to happen. They're going to and I have seriously, I have have had nightmares. That they're going to come to me and they're going to say that, you know, 100 algorithms have told me that you are some kind of a criminal and I don't care. And it is, it's a Kafka's trial. It is exactly what's going to happen. Because, you know, people think that it's fantastic. I have been to people in Northeast Delhi who've had that experience. They have come out of their house to hail a rickshaw, to go somewhere. They've been shot at the back. Then they've been arrested for being a rioter. Although they were the victim in bars for 14 months without any medical care now that person cannot uh, raise his hand because the the bullet is lodged in in his nerve or something he cannot work a wife doesn't work kids are there so it they that has happened to them so why do you think it won't happen to us so it is a very unless you know unless we kind of work on ai all plus Everything else, everything else that we have in us. Not the best notes to finish yeah, the discussion, yeah, but, but this is what it is. So time no for Q&A. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, we have a yeah, moderator. Hello, thanks so much. We'll now be moving on to the Q&A session. Um, in case you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and someone will come with a mic. Uh, I believe we have a question. We'll start there and then move there. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful panel and I very much share your dystopian, I'm here, yeah. I very much share your dystopian ideas and I totally echo them. Um, just a quick thought before I ask my question, I think uh, the question of facial recognition will all the more be interesting in terms of um, how we see DNTs and IDPs, um, particularly in forest areas, uh, because there's the entire narrative of and all the work that's happening to conserve ecology. I think that's interesting. Just wanted to get, and you might just give a dystopian idea, which I would love, but just wanted to get some thoughts um, about policing of trans people and particularly um, of sex workers, right? I also trying to think about um, trans people who, trans women who do sex work, but also cruising cultures in the country, wherein you would have Sure, let's go with the idea of gay men uh, going around in parks late at night. In, so in all terms, the rosin cultures work, right? I, being one of the stakeholders and also someone who works in this space, I'm seeing an absolutely horrible police future. So how do you see that? That'll be great. Yeah. Again, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not hopeful at all because... Uh, you know what he calls improvement, I call scary scenarios. And again, so... Uh, when you talk about, you know, homosexuality, the kind of representation of homosexuality is very, it's very out there. People think, oh, you look a certain way, though you are gay. So 
I don't think the police needed facial recognition to any way harass uh, you know people who are presenting as homosexuals. But now with facial recognition, they don't even have to answer you know to anybody. They can just say, okay, you know, we have this. And then you have so many laws. You know, they have something called public decency law or something like that. And then, you know, public decency law, every, it's applicable to everybody, but it's worse for, you know, trans and queer people because, you know, most of them will not have a backup, of, you know, where they would be, where somebody would kind of defend them. And then, you know, it's the police and their tablet and, and you. And, and I don't know how to say it, but it, it's a very dystopian scenario. And it is going to increase because the thoughts that the police has for trans people, for queer people, are already so horrible. And you know, if you listen to them, uh, women in short skirts apparently are, are calling for rape. So you know, that's how they work. And then you ha give them a tablet where you know they can click your picture, and then everything uh, about you comes in. So I mean, you know, you can just think of the worst, <laughs> and then move on from there. Hi. No, I just wanted to very quickly. Yeah, just yeah. Saying that. Uh, there has been, of course, with the history of policing is tied to the history of deviant sexuality, uh, which through yeah. the Criminal Tribes Act all commu uh, criminalized trans communities, particularly the hijras. Uh, so we are seeing that legacy of, you know, thinking about, which is basically what all of the gender justice uh, groups say, no, in basically the transphobic nonsense about, you know, these are people who are trying to groom young people. Yeah. So it's, Save it has the children. this legacy there. Yeah. And so it is also disciplining of trans bodies in terms of how you access, where you access. Uh, and this is, this is the origin story of policing in terms of one of the pillars of it has been uh, the policing of what is considered to be sexual deviance, which we are now seeing being repackaged. So they are not an innovative lot. You know, they keep repurposing what they've been doing since the beginning. Exactly. They don't need facial recognition to harass the trans people. Um, Shaila, we have a question on that side. question could sound horribly naive after all the dystopia that we discussed but a lot of the, the algorithms problem you know obviously these predictive policing algorithms are seriously problematic but they are also not a clean slate when we come to India like they've been tried and tested and failed whether it is on on the ground whether it is judicially see like the sorry the Fred Paul one in Washington I think and a couple of other American ones so I'm just curious whether you hear of or see any sort of feedback mechanism whether it's it is with the regulators or whether it is with the the engineers were developing it. Like, is there any sort of cognizance that these are systems that don't work and we have data to prove that it doesn't work? No. <laughs> engineers, engineers, like uh, people I have spoken to, they're like, it's not the algorithm's fault, right? And it's, you can't blame the gun for killing somebody. So, you know, and, uh, and when it comes to the police, I think it's not about feedback because they're not using it the way probably it was supposed to be used. So, there's another, so that can be another discussion about the workarounds that, you know, a technology that comes from the US, uh, you know, because it's supposed to be working in certain conditions with certain base systems, how it works in India and, you know, what kind of workarounds, that's a separate discussion. So it's not worked like that. So the feedback that probably Predpol had in Washington doesn't really work in India. So we don't really know what feedback we are working on, but okay, we are using it because it looks good in the media, makes the government look good. Also, there's a, there's a lot of polit politics that happens. So, so in the end, they're all only using their informers and everybody. But then it looks good to say that, okay, we use facial recognition, right? I mean, it's, it's a nice PR thing. Uh, just it. a quick point on that. Like, I'm not privy to what's latest is happening in India. So that I'm just trying to... So at, in principle, what you just said is like the whole job of what people are doing. It's called reinforcement learning. That you feed in the system, something is not working. How do we fix it? Like, that's that's what these people are trying to do. The, the challenge is that if there's a model, let's say, trained on like the US, that does it work in India? If it's not, like, then what are people here doing? So I'm not aware of that, but I'm just trying to say in principle, like, that's the whole point of getting the algorithm right, uh, which I don't know if folks here are doing or not. I don't know. I mean, if... Uh, you know, it's if it's a it's a very like everyday kind of a thing. Okay, fine. I don't know. Uh, I think most people in India would be working on what's happen happening in the U.S. or what has happened, and then trying to kind of use it and do it in India. So it's a very secondary sort of a system. So maybe some feedback happens in the U.S., comes to India, then they try to 
you know, develop things that way. So I think that that's how the feedback is. We have a question on that side. Thank you. Uh, I think I have one comment and then a few questions, but not like really directed at anybody. Uh, all of us can think about it really. Uh, firstly, the comment is that the tussle here between you calling it improvement and you calling it scary is not really interpersonal. It is much more systemic in the way knowledge is produced. And it goes back to enlightenment when you say that scientific knowledge is this, this, this kind and somehow scientific knowledge is supposed to be pure neutral and natural and that's what natural science has become and then how then how you teach you know stem courses become very different versus then how other things are learned and then this kind of a gap between these two knowledge systems creates the way you learn something and then you completely are oblivious of what's happening in the way that these systems are interacting with a certain technology right uh, and then obviously the other side is just never heard so <laughs> It's you, it is because of that. And I think answer to that is definitely collaborative work. I mean, you cannot do away without technology, but also technology is not like some kind of a, just say, you know, if I work in the health sector and a lot of things, a lot of times what we hear is that, you know, doctors slam a lot of the patients, especially coming from trans Dalit communities, because doctors are some kind of, we are superior, we are better because we are, you know, natural scientific knowledge. Yeah. yeah, experts. Yes, expertise is definitely one thing that's added to yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, other than that, a few things that I wanted to say was that we need to, I agree to all of the questions that you've posed, but I think we need to look at the entire question of AI more critically. And I think you've done a great job of trying to put that critical lens up. But I think one, a few questions that I have then to look at it critically. Firstly is that who owns these AI systems, right? Absolutely. Who is the owner of these AI systems? Who are the people who are making these yeah. cameras? Who are the people who make this whatever cloud software? Blah, 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 blah. Whoever, who are the people who own this? And then where is this data going? And then what is the use of this data? And yeah. what are the possibilities of this data being used in whatever, whatever, whatever ways, right? Yeah. And one example of that rather, um, something that I saw yesterday when I was traveling in the metro was that there's this lots of posters put up of um, Desh Ke Rakshak is what it says. But what it is, is that it's an app-based police verification thing that has come up. And it says that you as citizens of India are now going to verify your drivers and your, you know, helpers and everybody through this app-based thing. So then there also you're using technology, but here it's government like owned of sorts, right? But I don't think government is making that technology. Yeah. I'm sure somebody else is making that technology. So what is that? What is the relationship between them about like data sharing and how is that data protected, etc. Yeah. And then the ways that the government then has access to the kind of data it has. And then the kind of image that, you know, your citizens have towards like somebody who's not a citizen, your worker is not a citizen or what. Mm -hmm. So like then it creates some kind of a... Already it's creating these kind of hierarchies and differences in the way that people, uh, yeah. And I think lastly and thirdly is the thing about accuracy. So it's getting accurate, it's improving, whatever, whatever. But when we talk about facial recognition and we talk about technology, we need to get more particular. What is the technology that they use for facial recognition? Like is some kind of a cloud-based thing which is only going to match like 30-40% I think. It's not even 100%, you can't yeah. possibly get a 100% match. Yeah. And that's why the entire point about accuracy is hoax really. Yeah. Like it's not the technology cannot get you accuracy like no, that. I think, the, I think the debate will be better if we assume that it's 100% and then what happens? Because in this way, you know, everyone will say, uh, it's not a problem today. So why are you worrying about it? But let's say if it happens six months from now, then what do we do? So as a society, I think the like we should consider that it will work, but then what happens? You know also, what I mean? accuracy is also like a double-edged thing. I mean, sometimes invisibility is what you want. You know, certain Precisely. populations yeah. would need to be invisible right. and Definitely. would not need the kind of uh, you know showing to the government that yeah. this uh, accurate uh, technology is bringing. So, so are we looking at that, or in our ideas of improvement only? You know, oh, accurately and more accurately, uh, kind of identifying people through this. So. So those are the things that we need to be looking at. It's it's not just a one way thing, yeah. and which is why I mean you were right that we need to be collaborative. And and I think more than more than collaborative because even anthropologists can come from a certain viewpoint, and yeah. and and even anthropologists can also not look at society the way critically some 
एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट कैन सो यू नो टॉक टू पीपल हु आर गोइंग टू बी डिरेक्टली अफेक्टेड बाई द होल थिंग एंड इट इज गोइंग टू बी द लास्ट पर्सन इट इज गोइंग टू बी द पर्सन लिविंग इन द फ्रेंजेस इट इज गोइंग टू बी द दलित इट इज गोइंग टू बी द ट्रांस इट इज गोइंग टू बी द मुस्लिम सो प्लीज टॉक टू दोज कम्युनिटीज एंड देन काइंड ऑफ बट you know to have the uh, hope that a government is going to think about this community when it has never i mean i don't know little too much so we can kind of look at technology and say please shut these technologies down because the other way around i don't know i mean ne- have never seen it happen so maybe will never see yeah, but thank you great uh, great comment thank you so much for all your very very thoughtful and engaging questions and thank you samarth and shivangi for that incredibly wonderful start to privacy supreme uh, we'll now be moving on to the second session of the evening but thank you so much to samarth and shivangi thank you